High Swap, Act 2. Does it live to the three-year hype, or is it some money-hungry hoax to destroy the trust of its community, feeding distrust to the fans of the first game? Those questions are valid. So if one dissects the art, humor, characters, philosophy, and emotions, the answer becomes very clear. At the starting screen, you get this hit of nostalgia from the first game, tailored with a moving background and music, which is heavily reminiscent of the first installment. Yo! Oh my gosh. Oh, that music. Act 2 starts out from the end of the first game, where Joey and Zephros are riding on the deer cat. So it's a very smooth transition between games regarding story. When the cutscene ends and the gameplay starts initially, the first thing that one notices is that the art and visual style are very reminiscent of the first game. It very much represents what the first game was visually. So if one was trying to convince someone else that this was actually the first game, then it would be believable. Because while it necessarily doesn't look exactly the same, it's very reminiscent of the original game, and doesn't feel totally different, similar to the music. Considering reminiscence, one could also point to the UI specifically, which makes known that there is a difference between games. If one compares it to the early game, circles are now replaced with hexagons, and colors are swapped. Hive swapped, that is. <laughs> if one compares late game, all that really changes is that they've simplified the textures, changed the space iPad hexagon from green to purple, and shifted the character placement. If one moves their attention from off the top of the screen, whenever you click on something, the click UI has actually changed, before one has the ability to click on every single item in the game and be curious like George, the first dialogue that is present really summarizes the state at which the characters are in, with a storyline that catches you up pretty fast if you haven't played the first game recently. Or if for some reason you didn't click the recap button. Hive swap is Yo, what? Oh my, no way. Uh-uh. They, <laughs> they also have fourth wall breaks in the beginning of the game, which means that self-aware humor is going to be very present in this upcoming dialogue. The beginning area really gives us a glimpse of what's to come in the future of the story with little slivers of art, humor, characters, and philosophy, which prepares us for the long journey ahead of us. Also, these guys really don't matter other than introduce the mechanic where you get options of dialogue, red for Zap for us, blue for Joey. Just when Joy was about to open the door, the enemy fleet at the very end of the first game crashes down into the subway, exploding the building, forcing the title card to appear. After the cutscene, we end up on a beach because apparently, thanks to exposition, the deer cat just took us there. How convenient. At least there's some joking banter that's actually quite humorous. Mostly because one of the characters is trying to joke, and the other one just doesn't understand the joke, which makes it funny. This is a very common trope in the journey, because while both characters make jokes, each of them responds in different ways. So the dynamic is Joey makes a lot of jokes, and Zephros just can't take a joke because he's bluntly literal, and Joey is not. When the gameplay starts at the beach, you start to notice that the walking animation during the beach is extremely stuttery, and the character looks like it has a white outline that's horribly PNG'd. This is not okay. The first game did not have this outline problem, and the first game barely had this much stuttering. Every single time you move in this game, it just looks bad. It's not smooth whatsoever, and at least not as smooth as the original game. The duo then ventures into the cave, aka literally someone else's home, and start admiring an abstract form of very schizophrenic art, which spirals into a deep philosophical conversation about the whole concept of choice, simply by drawing their own conclusion from personal experiences, by interpreting art for literally five minutes straight. Besides that, the topic of not only taxidermy comes up. It's when you kill an animal, take out all its inside and stuff and corpse it with fabric, then you display it in your house as a sick display of dominance over nature. <laughs> but that finding some alien mushrooms in a cave apparently digs up some deep past trauma for Joey. When I was little, my dad taught me how to tell poisonous plants from edible ones. I saw him get sick from something he had on an adventure so many times that I'm pretty sure he just made it all up. That's probably why I decided to stop trusting anything he said. Oh. That's sad. These two things are literally the only thing notable about this cave, simply because 
you know, that costume that they've been trying to find this entire time that you were supposed to be looking for initially, so that way Joey can blend in this alien society, is not even in the cave. So it turns out, the thing you needed to progress the story was in the garbage pile. You know, that thing you passed initially. <laughs> Meaning that the entire point of the cave is to give the characters a vehicle to inform us about their characters' backgrounds, which is a great way to go about character development. Rewarding the player for exploring, but it still feels like a total facepalm moment when you realize that it's not even in the cave that it, the game directed towards initially, so that. <laughs> Traversing through the hole in the cave leads you to a little village where there are very cute cottages which makes me very jealous because i wish i could live in a cottage that'd be great to just live in a cabin just alone by myself just vibing all right hive swap right past that is the forest that joey and zephros venture into who cares about the man-eating trees nah we good we gucci oh great a giant mosquito what? It literally just gives you the option to die if one's curiosity gets the best of its cat. What? What just happened? What? Which was surprising and unexpected. Oh my gosh. Okay, well, that's not that's not what we're supposed to do. This means that one has to find a way through the forest without killing cats. So Joey and Zephros head into the cottage, hoping to find something useful. This is where it's naturally revealed that Zephros has psychic powers and ends up unlocking the door. Which I think honestly is a pretty interesting way to finally reveal, oh, this this guy's psychic powers and we're just now finding about it just naturally. I think that's always really cool when a character reveals himself in a specific way naturally over time instead of just saying, oh, by the way, I have psychic powers, you know? Like, this situation came about because we needed to unlock the door, so therefore it makes sense for him to actually bring it up. Not for us to know about him initially and he'd be like hi guys i'm a new character also i have psychic powers that's stupid but i love the natural progression at which we finally realize that he actually has psychic powers in the cottage a giant bug is just vibing in the cage zephros hands joey a dance book joey finds some fake horns which leads to some pretty unexpected humor that one wasn't aware of previously what does this pair say about me i guess the sheer size and robust cover them give the impression that you're have a really big heart <laughs> Once Joey is ready to use the bee dance that she learned from the book that Zephros got her, the other unexpected thing occurs. A rhythm game. Not even kidding. <laughs> Surprisingly fun, although it takes at least one initial round to fully understand the mechanics of the game, by round two, you feel like a professional Osu player. Once the dance is done, the bug sprays it, not says it, and coats Joey and Zafros in a anxiety-relieving liquid to help them get through the forest. And I'm not realizing how bad that actually sounds, but I'm gonna leave it in because it makes total sense, right? No, it really doesn't. <laughs> While being jealous of Joey and Zafros's natural anxiety reliever, they make it to the train station. While exploring, the intercom guy in the station speaks a language that catches one off guard, almost as if he's muffled behind a dumpster in a back alley. I, I love the voice acting. Joey then goes up to the ticket counter to purchase two tickets, only to be immediately rejected by blood color. So apparently, if you have the wrong blood color, the machine won't give you a ticket. Leading us to the introduction of politics. Yes, politics. <laughs> Video game, okay. In this specific society, there is a political slash racial hierarchy based on blood colors. There are 12 colors in total, which I'm gonna read off because I'm, I'm not gonna memorize this. Fuchsia, violet, purple, indigo, cobalt, teal, olive, lime, yellow, bronze, burgundy, and candy red. Basically, all you need to know currently is that purple and blue are way higher up in the ranks. Back at the train station, Joey and Zafros try to find another way to get some tickets, which leads them to talk to every single character in the train station. These vast range of characters have their own dialogue quirks specific to them, so no matter who you talk to, you're always going to get a different experience, which makes each NPC stand out. Unless you're one of two NPCs. Zebra and Marvis. These two more than stand out, but for polar opposite reasons. Zebra. 
the music artist, says he has some tickets, and that he'll hand them over if we have Marvis give Zebra an autograph. Nothing wrong with that, right? So we do that. We get the autograph, and we give it to Zebra. Then, after Zebra cries for joy at his newfound signed album that he got from Marvis, he hits us with a, huh? My ticket? Whatever do you mean? I'm sorry. What? Is he seriously going to make us look for the ticket elsewhere? So after letting Zebra get his album autographed by Marvis, I go back to him. And he's like, Oh, actually, do this other thing for me, please. And then you go back to Marvis, and then you're just sitting there like, Oh my gosh, this is so obnoxious at this point, just get me the ticket. Zebra, more like Zebra, this guy literally scams you, are you kidding me? Like, this entire time, it's just a fetch quest. He's like, oh, do this, oh, do that. It's so completely obnoxious. This guy needs to give me the freaking ticket, I need to get on the train. I'm so obnoxiously annoyed at this whole situation. Are you seriously kidding me? Hashtag cancel Zebra on Twitter, I swear. So literally after 30 minutes of going back and forth between these two people and still not having a ticket, you now have to go looking for a ticket again for like a third time. I cannot believe this game is giving me so many angry emotions over this one stupid situation. Not in a bad way, but in the sense of this guy Zebra literally won't give me the freaking ticket and so now I'm angry over the situation and now I am actually invested in this character and this situation because of how freaking stupid it is. I, I just want the ticket, give me the freaking ticket. Zebra scammed me! The other character that stands out, who isn't a selfish, narcissistic backstabber, is Marvis. He's a purple blood that has very weird dialogue. Not in a bad way, but it just hurts my brain because I'm trying to decipher what in the world he's saying half the time like he's some uh, basic white girl from 2005 with a flip phone. While each individual character you talk to has dialogue that works in some way, adding to the charm, Marvis's quirks can occasionally be confusing to dissect. Besides that, during the fiasco with Zebra, while talking to Marvis, I can't tell if he's actually being genuine or if he's trying to butter up Zebra. Hmm. In any case, Joey and Zephros are still looking for tickets. Since Zebra is literally being the worst character in the game, they stumble across Elward, who offers two fake tickets for one real one. Hot lil JK, she's also being difficult. How am I this emotionally invested in a game when I've only been playing it for two hours at this point? I don't understand it because now I got another person, right, to helpfully help me find a ticket, but of course, L word is also like, Oh, I never said it was gonna give you two fake tickets for one real one. Like, I'm actually mad. Wait, never mind. All we had to do was give her our pogs, and now we have the ticket. So, after an hour and a half of this dumb fetch quest between five different people, we're finally on the freaking train. Oh my gosh. While Joey and Zephros are riding on the train, they get a message from some anonymous account that both Earth and Alternia are going to be destroyed in 11 days. That is, if we don't go through the portal, apparently. And now somebody else named Critia is telling us, Yeah, the world's gonna be destroyed, but it's gonna be okay. Like, what in the world? That was such an exposition dunk. This further cements the idea that every single character that you talk to in this game has their own fleshed out ideologies and dialogue that separate each individual from everybody else, including a cowgirl named Skyla, who gives you a fetch quest to get some sort of medicine for her alien pet. I think it was just some blatant misadventure for the sake of story progression, and or taking up more space in your mind. Or maybe it's just a secret achievement. No clue. Although in the first playthrough, one doesn't know whether or not a wild goose chase is happening for the alien medicine, one thing for certain is that you'll stumble across the first fight in the game at about the three hour mark. This brings up an interesting point that there's really only one fight scene in this game. Well, technically, three. Really, two. But actually, one because a fight scene would indicate that both parties would be fully aware that there's a fight scene and not some splinter cell mission where you have to silently assassinate somebody. No matter the amount of fight scenes, although that is the topic of discussion, the first game has four fight scenes and the second game really only has one fully fleshed out fight scene. And the reason for that is that the developers never really force a fight scene. They only integrate it 
when necessary. The first game had so many because Joey's house was literally being invaded by so many aliens as is, which obviously meant that there were a lot more opportunities for said fight scenes, simply due to multiple enemies being on the premise. The second game doesn't have that many fight scenes, since one, Joey is literally on an alien planet attempting to be undercover as an alien, which means obviously that she can't get into too many physical conflicts with people, otherwise she'll be sus by the aliens. Two, Storyline wise, it wouldn't make much sense if Joey just went around beating everybody up. And three, her horns might come off. Which luckily they didn't during this fight scene even though Joey literally got force pushed into the ground. Sending Zephros in a Hulk rage mode and proves not only that Zephros has grown a very strong bond between himself and Joey, but that the game is doing a fantastic job at natural character development by showing us that in the first game, they were aliens to each other. But by act two, they slowly transition into becoming friends who will always stand up for each other. Joey herself stands up after the fight and they both walk into the hallway, where the music transitions into a muffled, echoey melody, which is perfect symbolism that we're transitioning between areas, leaving the old behind to experience the new. At this point, Joey starts asking about romance on this planet, since these two were being flirty, which brings about the conversation about the Alternate Quadrant, which is a four-section system that basically means that every alien has four aliens that they have certain connections with in order to survive in this specific society, spiraling into a very deep and philosophical arrangement about said society. Next part of society are the basic white girls of this alien race the Greenbloods, who are complaining about someone stealing a sacred book, which when somebody finds said book, everybody's like, wait, some pages are torn out of this sacred religious text, who did this? And then Marvis walks in and he's like, yo, what's poppin'? So since Joey and Zephros have been eavesdropping on this entire conversation, now they are getting tied up in the courtroom business to try to figure out who done it. So now we get to play some basic white girl alien version of Ace Attorney. No, literally, we get to play Ace Attorney and have to figure out who stole the religious version of Twilight. Originally, the funny bit about Ace Attorney was fun initially, since now the game becomes a mystery out of nowhere. While it does change the pace of gameplay and story by being well executed, action packed with the use of critical thinking, hints at the click of a button if one gets stuck, and developers literally making a separate art style for it, the downside is that while initially one thought that this was just a funny bit that would last like 10 minutes at most, lasted two and a half hours. So there comes a point where it just starts dragging on, where you just kinda want it to be over, which means that it got slow in some portions. But if one gets unstuck, the case gets interesting again by picking up speed once new accusations arise, as well as an intermission in the court that lets one have a little bit of a break before everything is said and done. Which is pretty nice considering that the developers probably most likely realized how long of a court case it actually ended up being. But Generally, near the end, one is just ready to be done with the court, especially when it's literally a third of the game in total. But overall, the characters did a pretty good job at catching up the player with what was going on despite those criticisms. Two and a half hours later, Joey and Zephros retire from being attorneys and instead have another weird societal political exposition, this time about toxic relationships. Ooh, you know that's gonna hit hard. Which makes sense considering the court case that was just present. Due to this, one realizes that the game really takes advantage of these in-between areas to not only briefly mention what just happened, but that it always spirals into an actually deep conversation about life in general, which really makes you think. Also, how have her horns not fallen off her head? It's literally been five hours at this point since she's put it on. Walking through the doors leads one to the Cobalt car, where not only does Elward make a reappearance to show that she's moved past the whole giving her some useless pogs that Elward thought were high in value in exchange for those cursed tickets, but that our data, a totally not shady person who only wants friendship and nothing else whatsoever, wants you to, and I quote, come in this room with me, I have a PS5. And we're like, oh, oh, the 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 and then she murders you with a screwdriver. So yeah, probably not gonna go in that room again. Considering that those are the only two notable things in this cabin, Joey and Zephros hop in the elevator and head up to the indigo car, where four rich snobs just won't let you pass until you prove yourself worthy. Which leads to a natural point where the term fetch quest 
becomes truly obnoxious. After almost getting to the front, we now have to backtrack to find somebody who knows how to write. Because apparently Joey and Zaphros just don't know how to write. How cool! So literally after another long fetch quest of trying to find some exquisite literature for some stuck up nosy person, it's still not enough. Apparently. So, now we have to find some weird artistic piece to please some weird artist girl who just wants art. Once you get the art, which by the way, not gonna lie, that art piece actually made me die of laughter. I now have to do muscular theater. Oh my gosh, stop, just let me get to the front of the train. So you go back and forth throughout this huge train that is just obnoxious at this point. Because after the third fetch quest regarding the same characters in the same situation, it just comes to a point where I'm just like- Just get me to the front of the train, come on dude. So now I have to go to the back of the train again in order to get more advice from somebody else that I just need to talk to again, in order to figure out how to do a muscular theater. Which in the process of that, the game just literally calls itself out for being a fetch quest, which is what I've been saying literally this entire time, so the fact that the game is even acknowledging it at this point is kind of a slap in the face since it's so obnoxious at this point because I keep doing the same thing over and over again in this endless loop, and the cycle, and then the game's like, yeah, we're fully aware we're doing this, and it's just like, dude, come on, man, this hurts. Confliction arises at this point considering we're at the six and a half hour mark, which is funny because I've literally been recording for six and a half hours in the sense of I've been interrupt interrupted so many times that I am actually frustrated in real life, so this just works out a little too well. And although one is still very much intrigued and still wants to keep playing, which is a good sign, at the same time because of the amount of fetch quests, and then also the fact that the same situation keeps happening, well you go to one person, and then go to the other person, but then do that on repeat for like three different times, with one specific situation, gets a little stale over time. And I honestly don't remember the first game being such a fetch quest. And maybe I'm remembering wrong, but I just don't remember being so annoyed with Act 1 with the fetch quest mechanic specifically. Yet in Act 2, it just repeats its tropes way too much. A full hour passes in the Blue Blood car, and after bending to the wishes of the snobs, Joey and Zaphros finally escape into the next area. This leads to a conversation of ending the Hemo Spectrum to hopefully make everyone equal, aka the blood class system that's been heavily present with each individual car, as well as the topic of thinking for yourself, and that sometimes there are some situations that take a while to process. After talking politics once again, we go into the area with the spiral elevator. Music, now eerie. They go down and see this. I don't want to use this, but I kind of have to. What? What is? What in the world am I looking at? Surprisingly, Marvis is here, which is interesting because he doesn't really fit the vibe, but does at the same time. Even though he's the least insane out of everyone in the room. Nothing is ever quite that simple. Uh, here's the door open to not just anybody. It doesn't. You see, I want to play. Now I'm scared. It's real simple, Joe. I'm gonna spin the wheel right here on this door. Whatever color it lands on, that's the color troll I want you to- Uh, no, I ain't doing that, uh-uh. Uh... -uh. uh... I don't know how to process this. So, Marvis literally just basically almost killed Zephros by incapacitating him. And I'm here like, I, I don't, I, what? I don't have to kill somebody, right? I can just fake it and everything will be all right. Right? Because Joey is here, like, super depressed, and I'm here, like, just utterly shocked. So, like, 
we can just fake bodies. Right? Surely after all we've been through, we can figure out this puzzle. Surely. Joey does exactly that, by taking a picture of someone sleeping, and then takes it back to the clowns. Apparently, one dead body wasn't enough. So now, we gotta kill some teal blood. Wow, how freaking epic. Wow, I can't wait. I'm so excited. Wow. She finds a teal blood, but this time she takes the sword as proof. But of course, Mr. Axe Splatter here has intelligence 100 and just doesn't believe Joey yet again. So now, Joey has to show proof of gore. So she gets the painter on the train to paint the sword to make it look gory. Back at the clown car, Mr. Intelligence 100 be like, No wait, just- Yeah! See, I'm telling you, he keeps doing it! And now, Joey has to kill a purple blood. You know, a clown in this very car? Bruh! Joey goes all the way to the back of the train, finds absolutely nothing, so, begrudgingly, she heads back to the clown car, still depressed as ever. Uh... This entire time, I've been complaining about how this game is a fetch quest. But this game is genius. As you're well aware at this point, Act 2 has the fetch quest formula. You do this thing for this one person, then you go here, and then you go back, and then you do that multiple times. But when you do that, in the finale, with the fake murders, you think that the third time, you're just gonna fake another dead body. But that's not what happens. Now, you have a real dead body on your hands. Which is such a shock because ingrained in your brain is this idea of like, I have to do the same thing multiple times because that's how the formula is. By the time you get to this point, it shocks you. Because you're expecting to do another fake dead body when really reality hits you by committing murder. So now both of them are depressed as ever because of seeing the dead body. Once Joey and Zephros figure out how to control the train by outsmarting the android conductor alien thing, they walk to the clown car again. Um, excuse me, what? Um, excuse me, what? Um... Um... No! Yeah! Are you kidding me? Now, when you go to the start screen, it is now that ending scene from the cinematic. Instead of a train moving along the tracks, now the tracks are totally destroyed. Oh, now I get the name. Oh, sure. Wow. Yeah, that's so epic. Yeah, how cool. So. Was Hive Swap Act 2 hype or hoax? Was it worth the three year wait? It probably shouldn't have been that long of a wait, but overall, it was worth it. Especially because of the amount of detailed storytelling, writing, art, humor, philosophy, characters, emotions, and world building. It took what the original game had and really expanded it further. Originally, the first one was a really wholesome game. Sure, it had monsters, but overall it had a very wholesome and nice tone to it. Whereas this game, it kind of just destroys that wholesomeness in a blazing heap of fire and just destroys all of your expectations, but in a way that feels very worthwhile and weirdly thought-provoking in ways that one wasn't expecting previously. I don't know whether or not I can say this is better than the original, simply because each of them have their own unique strengths. The first one being very wholesome and charming and establishing the world, and then the second expounding on that, and then shattering those expectations we had from the first game. The sequel impacted me more 
more than the original, simply because they tried to do a lot of things in the sequel that actually ended up working quite well, and that it probably wouldn't work well in the original game because the first one was just establishing the world. I was honestly surprised how many times I got emotional no! over this game. Whether it was annoyance, yeah! anger, sadness, or happiness, me? I actually felt incredibly invested in most of the characters. And if I didn't feel invested in some characters, it's because I only had one dialogue session with them and that was it. With all the criticisms I had, half of them were kind of dissolved due to later situations that happened in the storyline and ended up being a great journey. Which while it was annoying a few times here and there, simply due to some portions feeling way too long, it led to a better surprise in later areas of the game. The whole fetch quest complaint absolutely turned to dust after the reveal of the dead body, which honestly just shocked me, simply because it shattered my expectations as to what this game actually is. It wasn't a fetch quest. It was a journey about breaking down and understanding human expectations, whether societal or personal. Integrating into a brain that having to repeat a trope leads to the realization that life doesn't have to be on repeat, and that you can take action to change it if you feel there needs to be an important change in one's life for the sake of improvement. Thank you.